I'm Mike Schultz. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I was born in Moorhead, Minnesota, and then I went other places. And now I'm, I'm back in, well, Fargo-Moorhead for the Fargo Film Festival. I, I make documentary films, but they're not like what most people probably think of as documentary films. Um, I've never done a film about the death penalty or, you know, the plight of an endangered species. In 2008, when Facebook was young, I, d I didn't know what to do with Facebook, so I just one day just typed on there, I could really use a, f a project for a feature-length documentary film. I'd never done one before, and I guess I thought that's what Facebook was for at that time, was just to, you know, beg people for ideas for, you know, the, dir the direction that your life would take. Um, and then a, a friend of mine said, well, I just actually have a great idea for a documentary. Um, I just did a, a, a story for Minnesota Monthly Magazine about this guy who led a snowmobile expedition um, across the North Pole, and his goal was to get to Moscow. And it, it failed spectacularly. And then when he came back, he became the biggest drug smuggler in Minnesota in the 1970s. Oh, and then he disappeared without a trace. So I thought, well, yeah, that, that sounds like a pretty good story. Um, there was also 16 millimeter footage of this expedition. So I already had, you know, possibly access to all this great uh, imagery. Because um, who, I mean, who doesn't love 16 millimeter film from the 1970s? It's beautiful. Everything's orange and blue and gorgeous. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I started making that film in 2008. It took me about four years and uh, turned out okay. Pretty good. Bill is kind of a wild one. I think he had fantastic dreams about his future, although he never told them out loud. It was an attempt to go around the world by snowmobile. I didn't have a clue where the hell we were. We should have had our head examined, but we didn't. You mean the, the, the drug end of it? Yeah, and that was the 70s, you know. A lot of people come away from Wild Bill's run um, amazed at all of his criminal exploits, but I, I really got into the story for the Arctic expedition. I mean, I love that they made matching snowmobile suits and matching helmets, and they had matching snowmobiles. So like, they looked like a little army out there on the snow. Um, uh, just their, their like, the coordination of that kind of stuff, I just thought was um, was fascinating. Um, so I really got into the sort of the iconography of their snowmobile expedition. I don't know if anyone else cares about that stuff. I think most people want to know, you know, how much money did he make smuggling drugs, and you know what happened to him when he disappeared. But you know that's just kind of the third act twist to me. Um, I just really like the these, these guys in matching outfits snowmobiling across the tundra. Well, I have our book here, and this is all articles on uh, the trip that was in the papers and stuff. This is stuff I saved, you know, and it's many years already, so. And here's one of the jackets we wore. We didn't wear this too much out on the, on the ice. When it was good and cold, we wore something different, but this is the jackets we wore. Well, that's our 
logo and some other details. And these are articles on magazines that were wrote on the trip. And there's quite a few good articles in them. Uh, we don't want that on Bill Cooper, do you? <laughs> well, this is all stories on Bill Cooper. But these are all articles. In fact, all these are on Bill Cooper. All the things he was supposed to have done. And there's so many articles in here. Well, here's a good one here. Well, it's all here because I, like I said, he was my brother-in-law and I haven't seen him. So he just appeared real fast like. I don't remember what year he bought the squirrel cage bar, but I knew him. We were good friends. I wouldn't uh, say he was my best friend, but we were good friends. Yeah. I, no, most of those old timers that uh, knew Bill, you know, they're mostly gone now. Last year, we were out in the mountains in Arizona on our ATVs. I met a guy that knew Bill Cooper, and I didn't say a word. Now, I wanted to get all I could out of this guy before I admitted that I knew Bill Cooper. So I started asking him questions about Bill. Then he told me, I ah, said, I seen Bill a couple years ago. I've had other people say they've seen Bill. I asked him, did you talk to him? No, he said, I didn't talk to him. Well, then you know right off the bat that, yeah, you've seen somebody that looked like Bill, but you didn't see Bill. I'd hate to... Probably it's a good thing you don't know what happened to him. B Bill did absolutely everything he could to be a good father. He did that at the same time, being exactly who he was, because you can't change your personality. I think that some of that wonderlust uh, kind of um, wore off on me, if you will. And uh, I'm, I've always been a dreamer. I've always had high goals and believed that my life could also be extraordinary. And I think that's probably something I got from Bill. I think he had fantastic dreams about his future, although he never told them out loud. He lived his life in a way that I've got these phenomenal things that are going to happen. I don't know what they are, but if I keep going, I'm going to make them happen. <laughs> So it seemed kind of like natural for this man who always thought bigger than life that, oh, we could take snowmobiles. We could actually go to the Arctic. And could we go across the Arctic and end up in Europe someplace? I mean, it was just a totally fantastic dream that became, you know, a reality. You know, it, I, I really didn't know what to think of him. Had his black, big black beard and, and um, he looked at me and said, you know, do you want to go to the North Pole? And I said, tell me more. Well, I don't know. We were just sitting over at Willow River there, and Bill Cooper is my brother-in-law, and they started talking about it. So we thought, well, let's try it. So we did. The story I got that Bill was sitting in a tavern somewhere, and Playstead was bragging about having gone to the North Pole by snowmobile. Well, Playstead, the Air Force actually picked him up there. I think about 1968, I, I believe, and he was really the first person to ever reach the North Pole on a snowmobile. And Bill's response was, well, if I was going to do that, I'd start in Minnesota. See, when place that went to the pole, this is where they worked out of alert. Right. And yep. they just made that little hop up there. Grandma could have done that. Yep. No, it was not a... No big deal. No. They'd taken all their gear up to uh, Ellesmere Island and jumped off there and went the 300 miles to the pole. And Bill said, I can make a long trip out of this. 
I'll start in Minnesota. In fact, I'll go around the world. Well, that was the goal, to go from uh, Forest Lake, Minnesota to Russia. And why? To make a movie, do uh, whatever, you know. Well, we were going to start in Minnesota, travel up through Canada, between Ellesmere Island and Greenland, and then we would go down through Norway, Sweden, Finland, and into Russia to Moscow. Now, provided we were, were successful with that part of it, we would then go across Siberia and come back by way of Alaska. There was a lot of debate about could we actually make it all the way on snowmobiles. The idea was let's get there and see what it looks like. That's the way built kind of operate anyway, you know, building things as, as, as they happen. If it's open water, we got to call a plane and we do it that way. But otherwise, we were going to go on snowmobiles all the way. Nick, what are you looking at here? What is this thing? <laughs> There's another expedition that Bill Cooper went on. He told me about the preliminary trip, the trial trip that they took to Alaska. We rode up to Alaska in 14 days. He had all the clippings. He was real. I mean, this had happened. Well, this, is, uh, this is Bill Cooper. This is Frank Larson. This is me. And this guy here, he was just, just standing around so he had his picture taken. And I thought, well, um, seems legit. But he could talk anybody into almost anything. Yeah, he was a talker. He didn't have to convince me very hard, unfortunately. He had asked me if I wanted to go, and I, of course I shouldn't have went, but I did anyway. Well, they, first they did the trip to Anchorage. They didn't even get through with that. And Bill started talking about going around the world on snowmobiles, and I, I just laughed it off. I thought, well, he talks, you know. Just told him that I, I thought it was a dumb idea, you know, that he should get somebody else to do it. Then he'd just laugh and say, oh, you'll, you'll make it. You're a tough Norwegian. <laughs> oh. There was a lot of work putting this stuff together. And of course, you need a lot of cash. He had to talk to somebody into getting this money to go on this trip, you know. Where did he, where did he get it? I don't know. Because it was pretty far out, you know. We were going to take a bunch of snowmobiles and we are going to go around the world with them and you want to be part of it. I'm sure we gave him snowmobile suits and we gave him boots and, and goggles, lots of goggles. And it, it was kind of like giving a kid a credit card in a, in a Kmart store. I mean, I mean, he just kind of walked up and down the aisles and said, geez, I could use some of these, I could use some of that. Can I have some of this? Can I have some of that? You have the record, right? The 45? It's in here someplace. Here it is. Well, Bill and his scheme. I'll say. You convince someone to write a song about him. Oh, I don't. You, you can convince, convince anybody. anybody oh. of anything. <laughs> you ever been that in was... car knowledge? <laughs> They left the Willow River on a cold winter morn. A new breed of heroes was about to be born. This seven-man team on their ski mobiles, led by a lot of grit and a man called Wild Bill. It had a kind of a circus atmosphere about it, taking off from Willow River, with all the people and all the stuff going on. And uh, I mean, it's a small town. They had an attraction. Somebody went inside of a little wooden makeshift coffin and blew himself up. And that was the kind of things Cooper would do just to attract attention. And I never could understand what, what was the connection between that and a snowmobile trip. But apparently it brought people there. In the back of his mind, they would buy beer and watch us leave. We're going to Moscow on a tour of goodwill. We're going around the world on our ski mobile. You know, I remember it as, it was like you were never gonna see him again. You know, you watched him leave and you're heading out and yeah, you know, they took off and all you could see was the backs of the sleds and it was really snowing hard. It was a rough, cold, snowy day. So yeah, it was.
Ready? Yep. Yeah. It takes a lot more than just plain skill to make the trans world trip on a ski mobile. It takes a lot of guts, sweat, and steam to leave a good job and follow a dream. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts, offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota. Explore hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for a great vacation or a place to hold an event. ExploreAlex.com. Tri-State Brain and Spine Institute. With locations in Alexandria, Edina, Crookston, and Maple Grove. Doctors dedicated to evaluating and treating all types of brain and spine problems, no matter how complex. 